running, Jeremy? Yeah. The base of the card actually came from a uh, 42 unit rack, mm. uh, IT rack. Yes, I'm an IT guy and I keep my Oxy assembly models chained to my server rack in my garage. Sure. Can you catch the door? What's that? Can sure. Yeah. So an uh, old job I had, uh, we had a co-location facility okay. and um, we took out some non-matching cabinets for some nice cabinets and I said, hey, this looks like it would be useful for a furniture dolly. It's a heavy furniture dolly, but I got into welding a short time later and I ended up welding the sides on with gas. Almost this entire thing was built with gas only. Um, I most recently added this cool little pull-out drawer here and I had some silver cracks in the rails. Uh, no, I actually bought these. I actually bought yeah, I bought these at Depot for twenty bucks a pair. Um, and then this here is a, is almost finished. Another drawer uh, for down here. And I'm gonna put some sides on it to keep my. Uh, what you'll find you're using a lot is two grinders, one with a grinding wheel and one with either a cutting wheel or a wire brush. I mean, ideally you want three grinders. That's pushing it. It's a little annoying. And then you're gonna have a drip. You're gonna have those those two or three big tools right here that you're going to want to constantly interchange, so that's why I built a deep drawer to go on here. I mean, this it doesn't get any closer to exactly, I learned this yesterday, so yeah. here it is to you, hot off the presses, um, the setup that you're going to, that you're going to want. Um, this, for my smaller tools, there's a lot of tools you need. You end up making a mess, you get crap everywhere, you got tools, you're looking, where's my square, where's my tape measure, where's my brushes? Um, this is the best thing I ever did. My, my uh, progress, my output has gone up enormously since I just put this one silly drawer. Um, so I've got a vise. As you can see, I've got a wooden tabletop. I'm kind of embarrassed by that. It's hard to find somebody in town that'll cut a piece of plate. I'll let you know when I find it. I'm working on a couple of leads right now, but a good piece of 3 8 inch mild steel that's suitable for a good firm tabletop for a welding table, it's a little tricky to find. I don't want to pay double the price to order it online. Um, it is a source, but the biggest I can get is three by four, and I want something just a hair bigger. And I can't, you know, I'm having trouble getting it. So right now I'm using wood, you know, caveats there. Um, use fire bricks, two or three of them to get you up off the wood. It's going to burn. Keep your keep your hose close by. Keep your fire extinguisher close by. As you can see, that's when I know that I'm going to take a break. It catches fire and it gets smoky. I'm like, damn it, the smoke alarm goes off. Uh, that's another thing, Chris. I I weld in a garage with a smoke alarm. Uh -huh. It goes off a lot, yeah. but it's not hard. It, it goes back off. Okay. You know? And some nights I'll go the whole night and we'll set it off once. Hmm. So it's not the end of the world gotcha. to, to weld in a, go in a garage. Um, I'll open the door every once in a while. In the summertime, the mosquitoes are a problem. I'll keep the doors closed for a long time. I don't have trouble breathing. I don't pass out and die. Um, so just. You know, He's a little smart about it. I mean, I keep the door crap. Sure, sure. Don't, don't, don't hot box it or anything like that. Yeah. So anyway, um, a lot of this, again, evolved magnets. Magnets are the greatest thing in the world. You'll use magnets when you're doing uh, steel, of course. Good luck with the aluminum or the non-ferrous, uh, the non-magnetic uh, uh, stainlesses. But, you know, for holding something together, or for just holding your, holding your torch in a convenient location, Magnets are awesome. You can get these things for four or five bucks. Whatever. Again, uh, harder free. Whatever. Um, I got one of these magnet strips here. Um, nail it to the side. I haven't really installed these yet. Um, it just you screw it to something and you can stick things to it. So you just hold your tools where you need them. Um, so I've got one over on the side. Hold my clamps. Get a collection of clamps. These are tiny. I rarely use them. Uh, this guy I use a lot. Uh, four inch clamp. Just kind of keep it close. When you've got these gloves on, you don't want to have to dig through a bucket to find these things. So you want them just, you know, you want them somewhere. You're going to be in the middle of something, you're going to be like, damn it, it's hot, it's molten, I need it now, I need a clamp. And you just, nurse, clamp. You reach yeah. over and you got your clamp. Yeah. So um, you keep your tools close. Uh, and you want to make sure that you can get the things with these thick old gloves on. Um, I use this thing a lot. I'd like a nicer one, but I think I paid like 20 bucks for it at Lowe's. Um, this little contraption, Evolution. Uh, before I bought this fancy welding, uh, automatic welding helmet, I had this number 10. I couldn't see a damn thing. So I set up lights so I could see what I was doing. I needed 
two 150 watt spotlights so I could see what the heck I was doing beneath the number 10 welding shield. Um, and it works, you're able to see it. Um, but it's a little ridiculous, get a freaking pot hat. Um, it cost me more to set up these lights than it did just to buy an automatic helmet. Um, but this still does help as a work light. And I just made it out of stuff. You know, I just pieces of all thread and some bolts and tubing and put it together. And it, it, it works. When you're, when you're working, when you have the tools, uh, if you're working, you're like, damn, I really wish I had somebody to hold this for me. Build an arm right there. Just build the arm, and you'll, it, your, your shop will evolve that way. Um, and you'll get your own style, your own habits. Uh, right here, I needed something to hold this core out of the way. This, this, I just use the clamp. If you have the stuff, make, them, make the investment. You know, the hardware freight is cheap. It's not like it's that much of an investment. Make the investment, have the tools, you can't beat having the tools. Um, again, I keep, uh, nice. we'll talk about this briefly. Metalworking, different class. It's a nice rivet gun. Uh, I just got that, real happy. Um, various tools, you're gonna use, uh, use a pair of linen pliers to whack things a few times or take a hot piece of metal and finish breaking it off of something. Um, some of my valve work, when I'm at pinch, I use this, but I generally like to get a pair of channel locks. Generally like to use the right size uh, go find one and buy it separately and just keep it with them. Yeah, it's pricey, but it's the right tool for the job. Um, and you need that kind of angle to get a decent, uh, to get a decent bite on it, to get a decent torque on it without, you know. Yeah. yeah, and it's man. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Yeah. It's too shiny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Lord. laughs> I'll burn it later. Yeah, it's I'll burn that cone and radium off later. <laughs> squares, but I use this for so much. It's a lovely aluminum square for, you know, getting things square, bottom line. Um, you, you never can buy enough of them. Get two or three of them. Uh, striker for lighting things. Uh, these little guys are what you use for cleaning the tips. Here's a welding tip, and this little guy has got, it's not exactly the right size for this particular tip, but it's got little corrugations on it. And you just put it in there and you kind of clean out the soot and maybe something might have bound to it. It might be a little bit of an obstruction. You just clean it out. When you notice that your flame is not shaped like a neat little cone, you realize there's an obstruction and you use these tip cleaners to clean it out. After every weld, every moment that you stop and look at it, the weld oxidizes. So if in doubt, you just stop and wire brush it. Clean it off, get it nice and clean before you go again, otherwise you're going to end up with micro separations in between it. Get a collection of wire brushes. I actually have a shameful lack of wire brushes right now. I usually have more. Um, another tip is you have different wire brushes for your aluminum versus your steel versus your stainless steel. The little bits get impregnated in the tip. You'll literally see rust on your aluminum because you used a, a brush that you had used on steel and it's got little bits of steel all over it. It magnetizes itself and huh. just makes a mess. Huh. And it will actually infect your aluminum well. Hmm. Now, are we making space shuttle parts here? No. We'll probably never see it in our lifetimes, but it's out there. You asked about AWS earlier. That's the kind of stuff that you can't miss, like not even a tiniest bit or anything. So yeah, it's, it's the difference between being a hobbyist and being a professional. Um, torch tip, you press it down, you get extra oxygen. So, um, the regular torch itself, <coughs> right here, uh, comes apart. There is your welding tip versus your torch cutting tip. These individual tips are what I was mentioning Harris is not a good purchase for because I've had a hard time finding smaller size of these copper, brass, this is copper, uh, actual welding tips. I need to get a smaller one. This is the smallest one I can find and I think it's good for like 316 steel. I need something for like 8th inch. Mm -hmm. I've got, I've got uh, 16th inch sheet metal in the back of my truck. That's Thick gauge sheet metal. When you touch 16 gauge, you're gonna be like, wow, this is the thickest sheet metal I've ever touched. And it's, this is gonna burn it up. And so I need smaller tips. So I'm pretty much only gonna use a mate on that. Or a really deft hand. So you adjust the uh, oxygen and the acetylene at the base, and then with this, you also adjust for a higher blast of oxygen as well. So, um, I don't know. Anybody got any questions so far? 
come to whose mind? What's, what's that little, that little gas tank top right there? You like that? Tell me what's special about that. This is actually safety based. It's got, looks like a nest of something. Spider, spider eggs. Down spiders? Down. Yeah. <laughs> well, God gave us spiders through the cap of a welding ring. There were no spiders before welding came about. Okay? Yeah. Spiders live in these goddamn caps. You buy your bottle, there's like a law that says you must get these caps that come with the bottles. You take the cap off, it stays in your garage for six months, a year, two years. Black widows, <laughs> little daddy long legs, whatever. They they live in here. I don't know why. Why can't I get cute furry mice in here? I don't. <laughs> Kittens, no. Yeah. Deadly spiders in these things. So I brought that specifically to show you that you end up with these really cool spider eggs in there. <laughs> if you personally don't like pests. <laughs> yeah, don't. Don't need to pass that. So anyway, that's the spiders. Um, so you guys can see I'm pretty high strung. I actually drink a beer when I'm loading to keep me from hurting myself. <laughs> Might sound bad, but the difference between being a drunk and being a guy who's pacing himself. Alright? Drink, a soda, water, definitely water, you're gonna sweat your butt off when you're welding. So Definitely want to keep a water bottle close. I drink a beer and also drinking wine. Um, I highly recommend this. What's this uh, thing? What's that? What's this thing? Hey, okay, so we're going through various general tools. Drill doctor, another tool I highly recommend. I had a guy ask me just yet yesterday, um, is that thing crap or is that for real? Dude, this thing is for real. I've got drill bits coming out my butt. I find drill bits on job sites, just on the ground, wasted, thrown away because they were no longer sharp. I take them home, I sharpen them with this thing, 10, 12, 20 dollar drill bits. Uh, this is like a 60 dollar one. They have a 100, 120 dollar one and I actually recommend it because it does additional things like put a split tip on the end for, for holding the bit steady, for getting into a different type of material. Um, the instruction manual is with it. It's a little particular, but basically you stick the tip in, you tighten this thing down, it's like a chuck. Uh -huh. Just like a, on a drill, like a drill chuck, you follow the directions to put it in a certain exact angle. Uh, there's little markings on it. You put it in at just the right amount. Uh, I'm sorry, on this end. Put it in at just the right amount. When you close these little grabbers here a bit, and they turn it until they're flush with the, the, the straight edges of this metal, and that adjusts the bit to just the precise angle, then you tighten it down. And then you take it out, stick it in over here, and there's a diamond-coated, uh, kind of like a Dremel barrel disc in there that rolls around, and you stick this in there and rotate it. It has a beveling on the outside. If it was tight, you would, you would see it. Right now, it's just kind of spinning. It has a beveling that, as you rotate it, it bevels the tip to just the right proportions. The most Ridiculous contraption. If you just told me, if you tried to get me to invest in this, I'd have been like, dude, that's never going to work. Um, but it works. It's totally restored a lot of blades, um, a lot of bits. Um, love it. Huh. Love it. Um, I, I didn't know this thing existed. I stole this drill from the club here. Uh, I'll bring it back. Um, grinder. Again, I bought this nice fancy DeWalt. Matt and I had friendly fun words over that yesterday. Um, you don't have to spend that kind of money. And I think this thing is like 120 bucks. You can go to Harbor Freight and get a $15 grinder. I don't know how long that one's gonna last you. You can buy some better ones there for 25 yeah, or 30. It's lasted us two years. Okay, yeah. so yeah. get. I would rather buy two or three cheap ones than this one nice DeWalt. And now look, this DeWalt is over 10 years old. I bought this with my teenage money and my first job and it still lasted me. I don't know if that one will last that long. The plastic alone is probably more brittle than this plastic, but you can buy a new one. You can throw away the old one and buy a new one for 15 bucks. Okay. So, but get two of them, if not three of them. You're gonna find you're constantly taking this damn thing apart to put the brush on versus the grinding wheel. When you get done grinding something, you should brush it. You've got these deep striations in the metal, and then you're gonna wanna take and clean them up and put the brushing wheel on and you're done. If you don't wanna clean it up before you weld it because you're like, hey, I'm gonna melt it anyway, it doesn't matter, you may be right, but when you get done with the weld, you're gonna wanna brush the weld. So, a lot of the welds, they come up as a big lump. Sometimes, in many cases, you don't care, but in other cases, you want to grind them flat. And then when you get done grinding them flat, you want to brush them. So, you're going to wish you had two grinders, get two grinders. Um, 
Here's an example of the different colors, different, I don't know if we can possibly tell. Yeah, oh no, there's a cover on the back. Uh, a little bit wound up near the beer. So <laughs> You're doing fine, Casey. Thank you. So here's a number 10 and a number 9. Put them side by side, see if anybody can tell the difference. Wow, kind of hard, right? I can't tell at all. I can't tell the difference. No, no, I can't. If you get really close, you can kind of see it. It's really close. So there's a 10 and a 9. You throw an 8 up there. A 10 and an 8. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a big difference there. And you can see it as the light passes in front of it. Huh. And now we'll go from 10 to 5. And that is no doubt. A yeah. huge difference. So you're going to want to use... Again, you want to use five for gas welding. Um, this torch right here, this little port of torch, you can use this for soldering pipe. Um, that's pretty much what it's used for, for plumbing pipe. It's great. Number five is great for this. Um, the oxy assembly is fine as well. If you get welding on really big stuff, the number five is going to get annoying. You weld for a long time. Um, I welded up some framing for my forge, my aluminum forge, the other, other week, out of uh, rebar. And it was a lot of welding, it was a lot of thick, thick welding, it was reckless. I was just doing it for fun, just to melt it out of a cheap material and see what I got. My eyes were really tired when I got done with that number five. Um, so I wish I had used the eight. Things you learn. I don't seem to have any permanent damage from it, but this is the number 10 that I took out of the one that's not clear. It was just too thick to really use. If anybody wants to look at that and see how how dark it is. You want to use that for viewing a welding arc. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. Now, outside in full daylight, you can actually see, but not by much. So. Yeah. Put it in front of the camera. <laughs> the camera has not gone out. Good job, Jeremy. <laughs> so the automatic one, how does it work? It has a nice little light sensor on there, and it basically senses the increase of current. And they say within a 25,000th of a second, I think they're full of crap, but hey, it's pretty fast. Um, so I can adjust on the inside, I can adjust the delay time. I don't know who would want it to wait. Uh, <laughs> I can't imagine. All right, so I have the delay time set all the way down. Uh, and then there's the sensitivity. Sensitivity does matter. Sometimes uh, as you're walking around the room, you catch a glint off a piece of metal. If it's set really sensitive, it'll darken and you're like, boom, and you walk into something. Um, on the side, it has a different adjustment for the actual start. So right now, if you hear the click, it won't even turn on unless uh, it won't turn on at all right now at, at that particular mode. Turn it that way and it's going to fire up under a torchlight. Turn it a little bit further, it'll fire up under a MIG. Turn it a little bit further, it'll fire up under a direct arc. Is it mechanical or is it? It's electrical. Electrical. So electrical. Electrical. Electro, electro mechanical. It's, uh, um, it's, I mean, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't drop down it. new. No, no, no. no. Okay. It, increases the, it increases the thickness, it increases the um, opacity of the, the wind. So there's battery in Yes. Um, so some of them are battery, some of them are solar only, some of them are both. You get battery assisted solar for better reaction. Otherwise, it's using the light itself and power itself. And that takes a little bit longer. So generally, you're going to want the one with the battery. Uh, the solar is going to sense it and it's going to trip that transistor. But it's got battery already. It's not waiting for full voltage before it functions in the circuit. So it's actually the better one to get. As soon as that gate is tripped, it flows. And you guys can all get a chance to use it uh, as long as you don't mind putting your sweaty foreheads against each other. Absolutely not. Uh, we're all getting into this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, again, this is the primary reason why I said this class is important, is because this gives you a chance to know that you're going you know, to go buy yourself one of these damn things by next weekend and you're going to be sweating all over money. So I don't care. And if you do, do it. I don't care. But, uh, oh, wear a ball cap. You can also do that if you don't want anybody else to sweat on your forehead. Wear a ball cap backwards. And these things loosen up enormously, and you can just put it on, go, demonstrate for you.
just put it on over your ball cap. And that was all, all the way wide open, but either way, there it is. No sweat, no trouble. Literally no sweat. So. Eh, that was good. Yeah, you like that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're my fan and you're watching out. Um, yeah, I think I showed you guys earlier, these are the different types. Um, I got some sandpaper nearby. Here's a little gauge, just the thickness of the metal I'm welding. Oh, cool. um, so that, that was, I guess that was another question, but I was, I was not sure if maybe I should just wait until we actually do welding in the next class. It's like, what happens when, when the metal is, is so thick that, I mean, you're trying to join two pieces of metal, but your, 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 your welds over here and the thickness of the metal just goes way back here. I mean, you're only welding the surface back up in the front. What about in the back? I went to the bathroom here now. Oh, I did. So, <laughs> All right. so what you do is you put a bevel on it. You use your grinder, which is why you keep a grinder around. You use your grinder, you put like a 45 degree angle on it. And you want to go about half the thickness or so. It depends on how thick it is. I mean, yeah. if it's really thick, you want to go a lot thicker. But you just keep the very basis part, the right measurement that you need, and that's the division, that, the area that you expect to penetrate to. And then you end up filling. You make multiple passes. Um, and you fill back in. Usually you can do a do kind of an S maneuver all the way down, and you can just deposit material in there to fill it up. Okay. You'll get to see that when we actually do the welding. Um, as you can see, it took forever just to get through all this intro. Um, and then there needs to be more questions. If anybody has any, you're welcome to ask. Um, want to make sure you got all the stuff that you need. Um, more clips. Recognize these? No. You actually use them for sheet metal. I keep a couple around. They're metal. You know, they work. They're not going to melt. So I keep them for sheet metal work. Um, I use them a few times. Um, big magnet. Look at this. Big old hammer. Two big old hammers. This is a chipping hammer. This is what you use to knock that slag off. I've only used this once or twice because you basically don't need it unless you're using your arc welding and you've got the coating of slag I was telling you about. It's, like I said, it's kind of like a glass crap that lives on top of the weld bead. You need to knock that off so you can inspect it. Also, these tips. You're looking for how deep you penetrate into the metal to see if you've got little hollow holes, porosity, bubbles underneath. If you tap along the weld, tap along the weld, you'll get better aim as you, as you start doing this stuff, and your aim will get really good. Tap along the weld, if you see the thing sink in an eighth of an inch, you're like, whoa, that must not be a good spot. I might want to review that weld. So that's kind of what you use that. Also, a lot of times you'll weld something, especially in the beginning, you won't get penetration, you won't get a very good weld at all, you'll literally be able to take the item out and drop it on the floor and it'll separate. Because it was dirty, you didn't get hot enough, you didn't get both sides hot, you melt one side and the other side kind of drops on. It is really no different than a cold solder joint on steroids. It's the exact same concept. If both sides don't get molten, you're just going to stick it to the other side and you can break it apart pretty easily. So that's, that's a pretty important thing to know. And that's what you can use the hammers and things for to whack them and see that it's still there. Uh, let's see, where have I got on the other side? If you're doing something with like a ground clamp and you're having trouble clamping that on something, does that ever, that ever come up? Mm, yeah, I mean, once or twice, you find a way. I mean, yeah. um, you can stick it on the outside or you can, you wonder if you can solder the ground clamp on Well, I don't know. Like, I, there's just one thing I noticed is like, how. Like I see, I see them like work on like giant, you know, like gas tanks or something like that, trying to. They clamp it on somewhere, right? Yeah. Uh, worst case, you put it on a really crappy wall. You use it to attach a bolt to put it on solid. Oh, okay. Um, gas well, maybe gas well you clamp on your. Uh, that makes sense. Tip yeah. on. You good? Oh. Well,
when you're ready, you tighten it up to a certain degree. I have this thing, I tighten it up hand tight, and it's just freaking working. There's little measurements on there, I don't know what the hell you need them for because this thing just works. Um, but that sounds good, right? You don't have to worry about those particulars. Uh, clever little invention I have for keeping the door open. Magnets, good, <laughs> love it. Um, and half of what I know about MIG welding, I got right here on this damn guy, right inside the door. It tells you the type of material, the, um, the, the gas that you want to use, the type of wire that you're using, the thick. Uh, this is the largest 120 you can, that I could find. Oh, okay. Um, I got you. And that's why I bought it. I was going to get the 240, and it's not that hard to do 240. Uh -huh. Three phase is tricky. To yeah. find. You can't even get that in the residential area. Right, right. But 240 is nothing to be afraid of. I mean, it's just. 30 bucks. Well, I've got, I've got a two-phase in my house. Right, right, yeah. yeah. You just need two legs of the, of the 240 that they sent to your house. Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway, I'll tell you about the different types of material. Interesting thing to note, different types of material, you might want to turn your polarity a different way. So the, uh, the way the current runs, you know, positive, negative, or negative, positive, sometimes you want to throw the electrons at it, and sometimes you want it to draw the electrons in, huh. electrons in. Um, and you change the polarity on this particular device, and most are just like it, by loosening a nut driver on this particular wire right here, and flip it over to the negative side or the positive side, uh, depending on what you're welding. Um, so what is it here? Uh, steel, uh, DC, electronegative. Um, this, okay, so using the, the flux core, you want to use electronegative. Everything else uses electropositive in this particular case. I don't know a lot of the details behind it, feel free to look it up, but it's here and it works. I used flux core in the beginning. I used it with uh, electro-negative, flips it over to positive, and life is good. So um, I have, this is some flux core wire that came with the thing. Um, it made a spattered mess. I'll try to bring you an example next time. Somebody here's gonna get a flux. It's okay. I mean, it, it'll, it'll build little carts, it'll build this, it'll just leave a lot of crap. It'll work. It'll build a grill in a heartbeat. Uh, it'll put a, a bumper on a farm truck. I mean, who cares? Um, it, it costs a little bit more because they have to put some, I don't know how they put the flux in the core. Get, I don't know how they do that, but neat stuff. Um, so they don't need the gas because it makes its own gas. But it doesn't do a very good job. It makes a mess. So. Where do you touch the gas stuff? Like? This little guy right here is a hose that comes off the back this welder comes off the back and it feeds to the inside comes out through some bill here uh, yeah pulling that out right now we're probably to take the wires apart so I will just show you down the end what I was showing you guys earlier if you look around these notches here it does this transition there's these little air holes the gas holes that the gas flows out through you get enough so that it floods this hood right here. And it just keeps it, just gas coming out right there. This is fairly dirty. Should have cleaned it, but that's what it looks like when it's in a normal use. You have this little bead on the tip. And when it gets dirty, you just scrub it with a wire brush or sandpaper. Does the trigger control the flow of the filament, or does it also, is, is gas going out like a steady rate? Right? Okay. Oh, no, no. It controls the gas, it controls electricity, and it controls the mechanical feed. Gotcha. So, hold down if you want it hotter. More or less. Same temperature. What you do for that oh, is really? adjust it on the front. Another key, po key point. We'll talk about it more during the big class, but I don't mind talking about it. Huh? Um, so, you can adjust the wire speed, how fast the wire comes out, which completely changes the nature of the weld. And you can also change the, basically the temperature, the voltage, the amperage. This is actually the amperage speed um, right there. Um, this one is fairly basic. It's the 140 model. It's not the cheapest model they have. It only has like four settings. Pay like $100, $200 more. You get like 10 settings. You get a little bit more features to it. Um, it's a fairly basic one. I bought a fairly basic name brand one instead of a complicated cheap one. I should have bought a complicated cheap one. So that's what I would kind of recommend. Think about before you buy. Um, you get a lot more features if you're willing to give up the name brand. Um, as long as you've got the warranty or uh, just, you know, like I said, you buy it from Harbor Freight, take it home, use it right away, and make sure it doesn't blow up. So this will hold the material? 
Yeah, it'll hold. Uh, so I'll use it for something like you know holding this square over that. And, uh, oh, cool. You know, while I weld it to a perfect square. And of course, I'm tapping it, I'm measuring it, I'm being real careful about it, but it holds it yeah. just long enough, just enough. This I like because it's not that strong of a magnet, so I can still tap it and move it. Whereas these are a lot stronger, those are insane. Those are annoying to use, that's why I use them for all the tools. You try to put those on your work and you're just fighting the magnet when you're welding. Um, that's steel, most of what you're gonna do is probably gonna be steel. Um, with aluminum, uh, we'll talk about that during the during the fabrication class. You end up using something like wood or a complex table with slot T slots in it, and like little hold down clamps all over the place to frame it up and hold it in just the right position. Then you tack weld it. Once you've got everything tack welded, you release it from the table. You kind of raise it up on like fire bricks or something like that in the air, so it doesn't get burned or gets away from the, the thermal. Uh, effects of the table surface. You want it to be like an even heat. You don't want it to be real close to another surface if you can help it. And then you can weld around it as a final finish weapon. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of different little tips and tricks. And you'll find out about them pretty quick when you try to weld, uh, say, two pieces of angle iron in a corner. I'm trying to think of a good example. I've got a good example on this. The outside is one thing. When you go to cook the corner, you'll see that you're putting that tip in there and it just gets hot and that tip is trying to melt things. It's, the tip is as hot as the welding itself yeah. and you're worried about the tip failing, blowing up, exploding, and cracking apart. And that's where I get a lot of my pops from, is yeah. welding inside corners. You don't need to. I mean, bevel the outside right. I mean, this is a cheap little drawer. I was welding the corners just for the fun of it, just for the experience of it. I went a little bit in and I stopped. Um, again, here's a blowout. Huh. Where the weld just got too hot and it just the metal just kept dripping out and I filled it a little bit and then I was like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter and I stopped. You know, whatever. I let it go. You know, so that's a the lesson I would not do. That's a bad way. Bad hot. Now, that would definitely fail in American weld the same. But it passed like a in here in our hobbyist realm. Right? That little divot right there. I could have filled that in. I don't care. It's just a little drawer. That little divot. Yeah, it works. I mean, this was a big molten pile of crap when I was done with it, and I hit it with the grinder and I cleaned it up. When I got done, I looked at that and I said, hey, that's not going anywhere. I don't need to get back next time. So that's the difference between hobby welding and pro welding. Um, yeah, it's straight up, that's the difference. Um, this one's a lot better, a lot cleaner. But I did this uh, Friday night, actually. I was trying to get it ready. This steel, by the way, to my credit, this is the cheapest steel I've ever had in my entire life. This came free from a friend of mine who ordered a ATV from China, uh, from one of those really cheap, actually it was Korea. Um, real cheap ATV for like 1200 bucks for his kids, and it came on a pallet made of this really cheap angle iron. It's not even 90 degree angle. It's really annoying to work with. I made a lot of stuff out of it, but it's really annoying to work with. So I true up one plane. I true up the vertical plane with the magnets, and I just let the, the horizontal plane go to hell. I don't really care. As long as the sides of the drawer are straight, I don't care. So there's a difference, different levels of quality that you need. Um, it doesn't need to be perfect. And you get lots of experience with imperfect stuff. Someday I hope to do really good ones. So, uh, this cart is solid as a rock. This is all 8 inch, uh, some 316ths. Hey. That's not going anywhere. Hey, Max, you're just trying to teach the end of the class. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Go, I'm running out of things to do. You guys want to see the torch fire up for the hell of it? Sure. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. Uh, interesting thing I learned about the torch when I was getting it ready, uh, learning how to how to do torch work, is uh, it's kind of surprised that the assembly is only usually three or four pounds of pressure, and the gauge goes up to like you know two hundred or whatever. You don't need that much. Huh. So, move that away. So I can get to the gloves. I recommend nobody operate a torch without gloves. You need to get on gloves? No. no, no. Nobody, nobody's going to be messing with it today. So, anyway. um, you will also find that it's tricky to get used to striking it and uh, 
opening the valves and all with these big old gloves on. I don't want to burn the expensive gloves. No fooling no I can't do that. So anyway, I've already got this melted or mounted. When we do the oxy seventy class, I'll do it from I'll have everybody mount these regulators themselves. It's a neat, it's kind of a uh, timid, intimidating feeling the first time around. So you just crack this thing about an eighth to a quarter of a turn. And not for any particular reason, except if anything were to go wrong, you don't want to have to screw it too far, turn it off. Uh, same thing here, the oxygen. Some books say open it all the way. Some of them say open it a, a half to a, a full turn. Sorry, and they open it about a half to a full turn. The uh, setting, the, setting the regulator pressure is a little, little tricky because initially, when you adjust the regulator, it'll pressurize the hose. But unless you have an uh, actual uh, place for the gas to go, you won't get a true reading. So you have to kind of give it a crack. You guys might be able to hear that. Huh? Oh, okay. Hear that. Yeah. That's turned up really high. I'll turn it down to about 10 pounds of pressure, so a little higher. Turn it down open up a couple over there. Yes. So it pressurized the tube, pressure. and then I had to open this. Same thing here. I can hear it flowing with the ascending. And I got four pounds, that's pretty good. It looks like it's ready to go. No matter what, before you're ready to weld, you want to crack these and let the regulator settle out before you start welding, because it might say seven pounds. As soon as you crack them, it drops to three, and you're like, why the hell isn't it working? You didn't notice because you got excited and you got ready. I learned that from experience. So anyway, not really a whole lot to it. Not super dangerous or anything. Um, it's scary if you've never done it before. But what you do is you turn on the acetylene just a little bit. Get it going. Look at that thick black smoke. And you add in some oxygen. Try a little small. Add a little more. Ooh, right. Add a little more. <laughs> That is a small, fairly neutral flame. That's what they call that. You get rid of all the yellow. Um, not really too much fear of looking at it right now. Uh, the fear is welding with it. The steel gets really hot, gets yellow hot, and that's what actually damages your eyes. Um, so this is a fairly quiet. That's if we're cooking with gas. Right. I'm trying to do like 8 inch steel, 3 16 inch steel. Um, not the most efficient uh, operation for, our for small stuff. For small stuff. Yeah. But anyway, and then the other fun part is to turn it off. Yep. Yeah. Uh. Pop without turning off the oxygen. You get that pop. <laughs> you get scared of That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there, guys? Wait. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> so what happened? You turn it off. You turn off the. I turned off the ascending first, and nothing was left but oxygen. Gotcha. Every time it does it, I don't know what the exact. Turn off the oxygen first. You only have the top. Right. You end up with that yellow flame. It doesn't hurt to fire it up. What are some, uh, I guess, safety precautions when you're doing that? I mean, just things to remember. Um, turn it on very gently. Um, don't turn on the burner. These so things. These things more fit. Important. These things fit tightly. <laughs> when, you, when you go turn it on, sometimes it'll. May not want to build up the gas and let the area clear out a little bit. It's not the most dangerous thing in the world. If you have the right stuff, for example, flashback arresters that are part of, of they're part of almost every. I've never seen a torque that doesn't come with a flashback arrestor. It's like a one-way valve that doesn't allow uh, the combustion to burn back up into the bottle, supposedly. Um, I'm sorry, it's not on here. It's, it's right there. Don't uh, put grease on it. <laughs> yes, yes, grease, grease causes on the, havoc on the fittings because yes. oxygen will impregnate the grease and then you have explosion. You get that on the warning label of every, in fact I think it's it's on these warning labels somewhere, it says don't use grease. Apparently a lot of people have thought to do it. If you've worked with brass fittings at all, the reason why brass is used in a lot of cases, one of the reasons why it's used is because it's a fairly soft metal compared to steel or whatever. It's designed to be compressed a little bit and it makes a tight fitting. You don't need to dope it or it on super super tight it's designed to, to do a good job of that so basically you turn it on gently um, make sure that your your pressure is set right you don't want the acetylene turned up to like 30. Um, read a manual until you're certain what you're setting your, your pressures to 
If you crack open that welder's handbook, I won't tell you to do it now or anything, but you crack that welder's handbook open, go to the oxygen assembly section, you'll get a table on what pressures to operate at for what materials. And that's, that's just where I got started from. Um, the, actually, the torch for me came with a little guide, and the guide said to use seven pounds of oxygen or of acetylene, and that book says use two or three. So you're going to get mixed answers in different places, and you're going to develop your own style. You're going to develop your own feel for what to do or how to do it. Uh, but generally, keep your valves close. I, I've scared myself before. I've, I've had scary situations when I got the first pops. I freaked out, and I got to my valves really quick. Turn them off. That's a really annoying valve to get to. I didn't ask for this bottle. They gave it to me. Most of them look like this. Very hard to get to that valve. But I get the valves turned off. No matter what, if your hair's on fire, turn the valves off. The most important first thing to do is turn the valves off. You turn them off here if you want, but get them off here as soon as possible. That's going to stop 90% of your danger. Um, have a safety gear on the first place. Uh, I'm not welding, so I'm not wearing sleeves. I'm not welding, so I didn't worry about the hole in my pants. I'm just demonstrating the torch. So if you have the right safety gear on in the first place, like I say, it's going to take care of half of that. If you stop me and ask questions like that, I'm wound up. I'm pretty excited here. I'm teaching. Ask questions, and it makes me stop and think. It helps yeah. you stop and think. It's good. Got any more? Did you observe something? Did you get any more feelings? Uh, no. I'm sure we'll go through the process again yeah. next week, but but the main thing is turn turn the valves on, make sure the pressure's right. Get a little, open it up a little bit on the on the handle just, just to make to sure it's sure true. The and then go back and, and readjust. You want to leave it cracked so the so the pressure can equal so you can get to the right pressure. You leave gotcha. it cracked just a little bit. You can hear it flowing, and then you adjust the final adjustment that you need. Yeah. Then go ahead and close it, and then do the other one. And so when you're ready to spark, you've already got the mix going, right? It's not all settling or. All yes, it's all ascending. Oh, it's all uh, ascending. Okay. Now, sometimes, when I'm working inside, mm -hmm. I have, ascending is this really neat thing about it. Let me see if I can actually show it to you. You see that right there? Do you see how those are turning into particles of confetti? Yeah. You guys are going to hate me later because it's going to land on air. Yeah, they, they've been kind of flying around a bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, in my garage right now, they're all over the damn place. It's yeah. annoying. Every once in a while, <laughs> I do those. Yeah. Now, I looked it up. I mean, this stuff is carbon and hydrogen. That's it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there ain't even, there's nothing else in there. Yeah. Um, it's just a particular mix. And uh, like I said, they're real annoying. So sometimes when I like Thank this. You. <laughs> just inhale them, man. It's good barbecue. Uh, <laughs> so I turn this on. I hear it flowing. I'll crack this oxygen a little bit. And it might come out a little, a little, less, a little less oxidized. Side of trimming it off, right? Yeah. Casey, over time, as your bottles become more empty, do you have to adjust your regulators? I haven't noticed that because I don't use them that frequently enough. Um, I don't want to think of that. I'm, I'm sure I at some point you would, depending on how small the amount of pressure you are, but it's probably not a, I also, a long term thing. They recommend it. when you close down for the night that you loosen the regulator. So, because the spring in there, oh, really? over time, it, it you know, could okay. de-calibrate uh, it or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, one that's of the books I read recommended loosening the regulator every time you're done using it. So, that's what I do. So, every time I turn it on, I have to adjust the regulator. So, just... That's probably more apropos for a, for a hobby welder that's not out there doing it every yeah, day. Yeah, it's going to sit for a year. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, I turn this puppy back to about four. This one we're a little over 10. I don't trust that valve's accuracy for the first 10 PSI. It goes up to 150, so it works. Um, it's a cheap one. So I hear some gas. We got a lot of gas in the area right now. I should turn on a little bit more oxygen. Sorry, guys. <coughs> Smoky. Yeah, now Mike is like, see, I told you we're supposed to blow with you. It's a much better stuff. Oh, I see. Uh, if you get used to it, if you're not nervous, you're in front of the crap. Um, it gives you a much better start. Now, I mean, pretty much any book you ever read is going to tell you how to use the uh, assembly you only. Yeah. Like I said, we get there. It goes away. 
It's it's an improvement, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, you want to charge the next time? <laughs> I I guess that's really all I've got for right now. Feel free to ask any more questions. Uh, I can look at my cart and pick on my handiwork. Uh, so, uh, Harbor Freight, they sell the actual bottles of oxyacetylene. Are those overpriced? Or, or, or the bottles to, seem a little pricey to me because yeah. they're really small. Yeah. Uh, but I literally, uh, if I had extra money, I was going to buy some. I kept forgetting this weekend I'm not going to weld, but I'd like to have some for next weekend because I fear, and was that t-shirt, I fear no beer. I fear no oxygen. Yeah. I'm running out of oxy in the middle of a class or in the middle of a project. And the welding places are only open Monday through Friday. Mm. So I would like to have that little bottle, a little pony bottle that I can throw in my truck and I also keep full. And if, if I just, I'm going to have something come up, I don't know how full it is. It's, what's it going to cost me? 10 bucks to have it filled? Screw it. Just swap it out. Hey guys, give me a fresh one. I don't know how much it, it feels full. I don't care. Just give me a full one. Yeah. And it's not that expensive compared to being in the middle of a project and not being able to finish. Yeah. So there I is one, have, Chris, there is one thing. The really, really small bottles at Harbor Freight sales are fairly overpriced yeah. and where it really gets you in the long term is that when you go to get them filled you pay proportionally more per volume to have a small bottle filled yes. than the larger one. Gotcha. You know, the bigger quantity you gotcha. get the cheaper it is because they still have to go through the same mechanics of grabbing a bottle somebody taking it back gotcha. filling it up so you know maybe the medium space getting getting that 30 cubic foot size as a minimum is probably a good good way to go do people do, do they sell those bottles secondhand, really? Or mm -hmm. is it best to go just get a welding shop? Get a well, these are, is, uh, every one of these, I'm sure, was secondhand. I don't think I've ever had a brand new one. Uh, what it is, is they, they have a certain amount of time they have to, they're regulated to keep them uh, tested. Mm -hmm. So they fill them up to something ridiculous, like 10,000 PSI for two minutes or something like that, make yeah. sure they don't blow up. Right. And then they stamp them and they're good for 10 more years. There's a maximum amount of 15 or 20 years, the maximum amount that they can live. and. Even if they hold at 40,000 PSI, they're supposed to be have to throw them away or have to smoke them down. Um, so what ends up happening is for something that they already have. I got you. It's kind of a bum deal on it. You got a pretty brand new bottle and you like your stuff all new and clean. You take yeah, care yeah. of it and take it in there and they're going to swap it out. And then if you're lucky, they have a bottle of your size. Yeah. Some of the bigger stores don't even have smaller bottles. In fact, this thing is massive. I did not want one. <laughs> it's way bigger than I wanted. I didn't want this one. I wanted them to be about this big so they weren't so huge on my table here. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just what I got. And I, didn't, mm -hmm. I, I got a larger size there than the one I paid for. Um, this time I so got you, lucky. So you gave them a small bottle and got a bigger They gave me a bigger bottle. Yeah, they that's all they had. you more or? Nope. Nope. Really? Charge me the same price. Casey can confirm this. I think buying a bottle is kind of like joining a club. Yeah. Yes. The good side of it is you never have to buy another bottle. Because in 10 years when your bottle ages out, you're in the, you're in the pool. So gotcha. you just keep getting a bottle. Gotcha. Gotcha. And they absorb the expense of, of Getting rid of old bottles. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's kind of so if you can get by with getting the cheap bottle and go for it, because it's just going to swap out anyway. Yeah, but I mean, remember that little guy is. If you're going to get the little guy, I mean, that's what you got. Yeah. If you're going to get the little guy, get the little guy. It's, uh, I can't tell you anything else. Yeah. In fact, like I said, get the little guy kit. If it comes with a Victor compatible torch, uh -huh. get the little guy kit and then immediately plan on saving up to get the big torch with the big bottles. Gotcha. Or I guess another way of looking at it is get the little guy kit. Save up and get yourself a MIG. Because I think right now the set that I've got is a really nice set. Mm. A MIG and a set of uh, oxygen torches is great. I wish I had a TIG. I wish I had other uh, other things, but these are great. Um, so we, we've seen in, in the hams, the ham radio stuff, there's lots of different connectors for antennas. Bes besides uh, Harris and Victor, is there any types of connections we need to look for as when we get in, when we get a bottle, we'll get a kit, or, you know, regulator things like that? There's another brand. There's a, there's a Smith out there. There's a, the Smith is huge, uh, bigger than bigger than Paris, but Victor just owns the market. Um, there's little intricacies like uh, some of them are uh, female versus male. Um, a good example is this uh, acetylene. The regulator attaches with a reverse thread. It drives me nuts because I always forget. I just did it yesterday, so I remember now. But when you haven't done it in six months, you forget. Which one of these was reverse thread? Which one of them was straight thread? You're like, tightening it up. No, it's the wrong way. So the acetylene on this setup, at least, is, uh, and this is a standard bottle. So the regulator part is the same is, is regardless. It's whether or not this 
and this, and this are the same. That's what is going to be Victor specific or Heron specific, um, is what particular size of uh, threads that they use. So yeah, when you get the regulators, that's not a big deal. Um, uh, I, I think you might have a problem with close fittings. I'm not sure. Uh, but any of the kits you buy are going to come with all of them. So unless you're buying secondhand parts, where you're getting a bottle with a regulator and no hoses, you're not going to run into that problem. So you're not going to learn that lesson the hard way. I mean, like unless my eyes are deceiving me, it looks like what you what you're holding right there mm -hmm. is thicker than the black hose coming out of the larger brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so this kind one, of gas, so shielding gas. Yeah, this is a lot less critical. Um, these are inert gases. That's what that's the I and MIG and TIG. They're not flammable. Okay. They're not explosive, so they're not a concern. This is a flashback arrester, and this hose is much higher grade, and there's much more, you know, be careful about it, because it's, oxygen is extremely, you know, oxidizer, it's, you know, it's dangerous stuff to have just in raw form. So I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to swap those regulators? No. no I, you, I think you could, but you shouldn't. I mean, I'm not sure if they'll fit or not, but I haven't tried. Uh, but it'll even say right on here. I think this thing even says argon right on here. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it says argon. Um, it's a different size. I've even dropped mine, so I'm not forgetting. Uh -huh. It works fine. But uh, if I don't get any one soon. Uh, but again, it's argon, so I'm not too worried about it. It's, uh, I just want to flood the area. Um, I don't like any of the settings. They say use 10 pounds or something. I turn the damn thing up all the way. The higher up it's turned, the more money I pay, but the cleaner my weld is. And since I don't weld that much, and the more money I pay is, this is a $35, $40 fill, eh, whatever, I'll waste it. I, I want a good, clean weld. So, and right now, since my regulator's busted, I don't even know what it's running at, so I just turn it up. But that's, excuse me, that's an inert gas. It's not a big deal. Um, I don't play those kind of games with the oxygen and the so. Yeah. Yeah. Word? I uh, mean, it's, it's okay. I mean, uh, it's not nice. so you can get a new game. Yes, yes. I, I just haven't gotten to it yet. I'd rather buy some other tools. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not rich. Uh, so, no, that tool would sell it. Yeah, absolutely. Like maybe small bomb or whatever. But Victor? Victor is the type that you want to go after. Uh, if, you, if you can afford the Victor brand, because you also own a GTR and a nice mansion, um, that's great, by Victor. Um, if not, Victor knockoffs. Uh, like I said, I... How, how do you know if it's a Victor knockoff? Or Most of them will tell you Victor the size tips. Oh, really? Uh, I know, simply because it's really popular on the net right now, uh, that the Harbor Freight stuff is Victor compatible. Gotcha. So. Some of the gas houses in town, was air gas, over on WW White, they have nice retail showrooms. And you oh, cool. can go in there and look at all their bottles. Counter guys are helpful. They're not... They're not creeps like they are at some places yeah. usually very helpful to the hobby welder and you can talk about bottle sizes and gauges and they've got the brand names they'll have all the uh, um, you know, two or three different brands of welders and gauges and accessories and coats and gloves and safety equipment um, and buying bottles and gas from them is is much better than going with northern tool or harbor freight because when i looked at getting my inert gas set up for my mig welder I kind of looked at everything, and even though your investment up front is more because you're buying bigger bottles, down the road, your refill expense is way, way, way less. Yeah. Yeah. So the pros, no brainer. Air gas. There's several. Welder Supply over off Bandera. Yeah. Bandera 410. There's a little industrial park back to the east, back in there. I got a Prax Air by my house. There's uh, Welder Supply and Prax Air and Air Gas. You go in the yellow pages and look up industrial gas, and you'll be surprised just how many of them there are. And some don't have any retail showroom, but the one over on WW White is really nice. It's got a really nice a Miller rep. It's got a whole lot of Miller stuff. Maybe Hobart. And uh, who's the red guys? Uh, Lincoln. And Lincoln. Yeah, Miller bought Hobart, I believe, a number of years ago. Okay. Um, so Hobart. I understand it used to be quality, but when I grew up, the only two brands that existed was Miller and Lincoln. Oh, yeah. And uh, Hobart sure has nice branding. Looks nice. And I seen a Hobart welder in the power plant once, so I was like, oh, okay. But then when I found out they're owned by Miller, I was like, oh, took the plunge. 
and it, it's top-notch stuff. It just seems great. But like I said, in hindsight, I was telling him earlier, I, I now wish I had bought a more multi-feature Chinese knockoff than spend the extra money for, I, I don't know. You know, time will tell. But like I told, what I was telling him that was get it. $75, and it's a, it's a better welder than I am. Yeah. And it's still half to two, half or maybe a third the cost of a name brand good welder. I wouldn't say that the lower end Harbor Freight stuff is good, but if you started with their top of the line, it's not a bad place to start. I, I guess the next big question is, is if I want to start this, should I start, should I just go ahead and get a MIG or start with oxy settling? Uh, I think everybody should have oxy settling. Okay, I had it that's over Before I got it. Um, like, like Rob's question earlier was the hobbyist. Mm -hmm. Hobbyist is going to appreciate the MIG more than anything, but if you would like to actually become competent, I recommend you get oxyacetylene. Um, regardless, I'm going to recommend you get both. Yeah. Okay. Um, the problem is with recommendations, especially with, you know, I've only got like five or six years of playing around with this stuff. Part of the recommendations is, at least in my stage, is I can see a specific separate use for all the major technologies. It's like, man, you gotta get them all. Gotcha. You gotta get an arc walker, you gotta, get, you gotta get a TIG, you gotta, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, okay, right? absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, MIG is great for light material, and with your sealing gas, you can make nice welds. When you get up to a certain size plate, you have to have a stick welder, you just have to. Yeah. And then oxyacetylene is good for everything else. Heating stuff up, cutting stuff off. You know, you get, you're taking apart an old car, you can wrestle with rusty bolts or you can just whack them off with a torch. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you got, bolts, well, you got bolts on studs that won't come loose, heat them up and take them off. My, you can't my, do that with anything but a torch. My project is converting a Volkswagen I've had sitting in my car to a little beam buggy or something like that. So awesome. That's, that's make that's make a I'm torch. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. I'll, I'll probably want to get You don't need a TIG yeah. for that. Sure. Um, Stick, not necessary, I guess. So the stick will work, but it'd be more convenient to get a egg. Mm. So in your case, I would probably suggest a set I think I think Casey's right, absolutely, that everybody needs to learn um, oxyacetylene, which I haven't. But to <laughs> guys who have an electronics background, MIG sure are appealing because it's big boy soldering. Mm. You just yeah. get out there, you got something in your hand, <laughs> yeah. and you start yeah. making Man sparks. Yeah. 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 yeah, it is. It's, <laughs> it's quick, it's easy, and anybody can do it. You can make some ugly welds. But you can stick some shit together if yeah, you need yeah. to. Oh yeah. You know, before yeah. you get good, you can oh, get ugly. I've made a lot of ugly welds that haven't failed. I've made a lot of ugly welds that have failed too. But <laughs> oh, anyway. uh, <laughs> so the first welding I did, uh, I had the torch and I welded a few pieces of metal in the driveway. Uh, a few months after that, uh, I got mad because the kids kept leaving the gates open and my dogs kept getting out. And I love my dogs. I don't want to lose my dogs to the dog catcher. So I got really pissed off and I'm out there with. Okay, a little bit smaller tanks, but I had one tank in each hand, and I'm dragging it across the yard with the hose strapped over my shoulder. And I go back to the gate, and I just welded the damn thing shut right there. Uh, Zinc-coated, not cleaned, bad angle, bad temperature. I was angry. I was melting the pipe. Made a mess. Two years later, one of them broke loose. The other two are still welded, so whatever. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it, it's been years and years now. What's up? I'm sure you covered zinc safety already. I haven't yet. I haven't yet. Um, that's something that so maybe gonna, we'll, we'll do real no, quick. No, we'll do it right now, yeah. You know. Zinc, okay, so there's interesting arguments out there that zinc is not immediately deadly. However, zinc is not good for you. It is no doubt that it is not good for you. Um, it is, um, what do they call it, zinc, uh, zincidosis or something. I mean, you don't want to breathe the galvanized coating on, uh, you know, galvanized metal. Uh, when you heat it up to about five or 700 degrees, it vaporizes and it turns into like this white smoke and it's just freaking bad for you. Don't inhale it. It's known. It's known as poisonous in the metalworking world. Toxic just don't metal. do it. It's like a toxic metal or something. Yeah, I guess zinc when it's vaporized and you inhale it, it's not good for you. But when it's in your Cheerios, a little bit's okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when you go buy fresh cold steel, you're not going to run into zinc. But you start grabbing hardware out of your junk box and <clears> welding <throat> some bolts together to make a hinge or something. Zinc. It's very likely that stuff is zinc coated. So you have to think. Uh, you know, pipe maybe zinc coated. Right, um, and you can weld it. You just need to do it with a with a fan outside. Yada yada. I weld outside with a fan if I'm welding zinc, and I have. I've welded some fence stuff and some gate stuff, and I have this big old blower that I got out of a scrapped uh, furnace, uh, you know, a house furnace, and I've got it in a frame that I built. It's a big cube box, and I set that puppy up in my driveway opening, and I'm or my garage door opening, and I'm out there a few feet away working on this cable or something, and it's just blowing. Air, I mean, just solid, steady air, and then I can weld on zinc. Do you um, need a respirator or something like that? If 
okay, yes, you should, but if you're in a situation where the respirator would help, you're not getting enough ventilation yet. Okay. So um, I, I do not want to play with that. Somebody somewhere has to weld in an enclosed space and they have to use ox uh, oxygen pressurized regulation and all that stuff. Let them do it. That's the pros. Okay. Us, us hobbyists, if you're in an area where you're worried about the smoke, don't do it. Get out of the area. You know, get to a much more ventilated area. Don't even question it. So, because a lot of that stuff comes up after two lifetimes of experience and you know dozens of cool lawsuits like the uh, uh, asbestosis stuff. Right. You know you don't want to learn, learn that the hard way. Zinc is bad. Uh, oxidizing any of the coatings and stuff, uh, vaporizing any of the coatings and stuff that's on the metal is, is bad. So is now when I work in my garage, I'm working with fairly clean, uncoated. Um, in fact, it's got like oil residue on it, and I brush it off with this wire wheel brush. And you see, it's kind of shiny on the ends. Yeah. That's from this wire wheel brush. Right here. Okay. And I beveled it with the grinder. Yeah, okay. Um, and then I hit it with a wire wheel brush, and I cleaned off that stuff. Now, I clean that stuff off so it doesn't infect the wet. Because uh -huh. I'm I was going to gas weld that. I'm not using any sort of shield, so I want to be really, really clean. Uh -huh. I didn't clean that because of zinc fears or anything like that. But it's a damn good idea, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Again, I'm an amateur, not a, not a professional. Um, so zinc naturally occurs as like an oxidization kind of thing, or? No, I mean the zinc is what they put on the outside of steel to keep it from rusting. Okay, galvanizing like, process. Galvanizing process. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, it's but you can scrape that off, is what you're saying. It's annoying. Right, so you can, um, I've ground it off on a piece of pipe that I was working on a couple weeks ago. I forgot all about the fact that it was zinc coated on the inside. Mm -hmm. So I started welding on it. And this gas starts coming out, and I'm like, oh, shh, <laughs> back away. Um, it's not possible to get it on the inside. Just go outside and walk with really good ventilation. If now, you don't, if you don't have ventilation and you do it, uh, you, if you do it for enough time, just like in a short period of time, not like over years, you'll get sick. Yeah, it'll make you yeah. sick. I read something about it a few weeks ago, and I swear I can't remember any of the details right now. I, but that what I learned is that it was not an immediate death sentence, but it was not very far from the sickness. Yeah. And if you were to work with it professionally and be so silly as to not realize that you're sick for a reason, you will die from it. Yeah. Um, but you won't die because you catch a whiff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just catch, don't, don't catch the whiff. Yeah. Yeah, just, you know, catch the whiff of socks. Don't and, inhale. Yeah, don't inhale. Put me here on the side of caution, just more ventilation. Ventilation. Not is, so the telltale signs you see white smoke coming from Yeah, it's out. a white smoke. Okay. It's a smoky white smoke. Like the same book? Yeah, that book is, uh, again, it's a Depot and Lowe's, 15 bucks. It's 90% of what I learned. Everything else that I know has come from some YouTube and, and just practical experience. It's a great book. I've never used coat hangers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wire they're yeah, horrible, wire. horrible metal. <laughs> they're just whatever pot metal. They call that pot metal. You know, it's just whatever was around. It's a mix of crap. Coat hangers for, for like a, a rod? Blowing, yeah. Blowing rod. Yeah. Particularly for gas, you just yeah. need filler material. Yeah. Yeah. Bailing, Bailing wire? Yeah, 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 yeah. Bailing wire is probably better than that. <laughs> oh, I see, yeah. No coat hangers. It's cross coat. Yeah. So I'm not forgetting anything. Um. So, okay, who's got money? Who wants to buy something soon? I do. You try to get something by the next class, the next two classes? I'm getting too disappointed if I don't buy the next class. No, 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 